All right, let's please open to Psalm 102. Psalm 102. When we are talking about eschatology, what's the, I guess, easier way to understand it? Because that's an odd word maybe for us. What are we talking about when we talk about eschatology? Okay, yeah, the end of our life is what we looked at last time, the idea of what happens to an individual when they die, secular view, basically oblivion, the uh, Bible view, you enter into the Hadean world, the spirit survives the death of the body, or the soul survives the death of the body. And then, um, as Ron was saying, the other... I guess, focus of eschatology would be the universe. How is it going to come to an end? Now, I would like us to read Psalm 102, verses 25 through 27 to get a pretty good idea of the Bible's perspective on it. Who will read Psalm 102, 25 through 27 for us? Philip? Now, the Hebrew writer quotes this in Hebrews chapter 1, but essentially, what is this telling us right here? Two things. First one, verse 25, is what? Yes, God created the heavens and the earth. And then what does it tell us? Yes, those things are temporal. God is eternal. And it says um, in verse 26, they grow old like a, like a cloak. You will change them. The Hebrew writer says in the New King James, like a cloak, you will fold them up. So it's talking about an action that God is taking. He, he took an action to bring them into being. And he's going to take an action to take them out of being. Um, notice Job verse 38. Uh, verse 38. Job chapter 38. And let's read verses 4 through 11 here. This is God admonishing Job on the fact that essentially Job... You don't know. So Job 38, verses 4 through 11, who will get that? Clint? Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? I was not there when it was formed. Who determined its measure, the terms of the mills? Or who turned it out from among the stars? From whence was the great earth formed? From whence was the plain of the bush? From whence all the things together in the four corners of the earth found their support? Who stood in it and knew that it was? Okay, so what's he telling Job? What what do we take from this when, in the context of what he's saying? Yeah, you you weren't there when I laid the foundation of the earth. You you don't have this knowledge. Your your knowledge is very limited. It's very finite, and there are things that you just don't know, and you will not know. 
There's no way for you to be able to even comprehend this. It's beyond man's ability to comprehend these things. Uh, one of the reasons that creation is beyond our ability to comprehend is because it's a miracle. It's supernatural. We, we can't wrap our minds around that. We can observe the universe and see that it's there. Just like people in the first century, they could see when a miracle had been performed, but they didn't understand that. They didn't understand how that happened, the power behind that. They, they can't grasp it because it's beyond us. It, it's of deity, not of humanity. And so here, it's a great place to look and to think about the fact we can look at this universe. There are things we can observe. There are things we may discover, and we may understand a law, a scientific law, if you will, from the standpoint of, okay, there's gravity. All right, we get that. It's a certain amount of pull on planet Earth, and on the moon, it's a different amount of pull or magnetism or however you put it. You guys probably know better than me on that. But there, there, it's there, but we don't understand it. We understand it exists, and we say there's a law because there's a consistency here. But nobody can explain gravity. You know, we can look at light and we can study light and say, okay, it's a wave, but it's a particle, but it's this, it's that, it's the other. It can bend and we can look at the spectrum of electromagnetic energy, but we really don't understand it in its fullest sense. And so he's rebuking Job here in a sense, and we need to have, as Mike said, that humility to understand, okay, God brought the universe into existence. We are just not going to fully understand that, and we sure aren't going to explain how it's going to wrap up or come to an end. But there are scientists who believe they can. Humanists, secularists believe that they can. And I want to look at a few of their theories here. The first one is, and this was mentioned in the book, the big crunch. Does anybody remember what it said about the big crunch? What does it sound like is going to happen? Sandy? Okay. So the Big Bang, things come in, it just poof, there, there's stuff there. And then the crunch is going to be what? Okay, everything's going to just crunch back. So it begins with, the big crunch begins with the Big Bang. It just says, here's the end of that Big Bang, how it's going to unfold, right? Gravity will pull matter back to a singular point and crush it all. Uh, and part of this theory, if I understand it correctly, is it's going to pull it back to a singular point, and then it's going to have another Big Bang. So it's, it's like the universe is, is just expanding, contracting, expanding, contracting. Isn't that revolution? It's like a catalyst? Well, it, yes, in a sense, that's what it is. But also, it's a, it's a concept that matter is eternal, which goes contrary to every other scientific understanding we have of the universe that it's not eternal things are winding down and they can see that but anyway so um all right so the big freeze what's the big freeze and in what i read about this it's dark matter involved if you know what dark matter is Anybody know about the big freeze? Of course, what does that imply? It's cold, right? Clint? It, it gets to this point where there's no energy that is available for planets. And one of the things I read is this idea of, okay, there's the Big Bang, 
in the Big Bang, then everything is spreading out and they see the universe as expanding. And there is this dark energy that is helping the universe to expand and will gravity or dark energy went out, will gravity pull everything back to a singular point or will the dark energy allow it to keep going and it will overcome the reality of gravity or the force of gravity and it keeps going and eventually everything's going to spread so far apart that it's going to be so cold that everything's just going to freeze. All life will just boop, not exist anymore. So that's kind of the big freeze idea. Then there's the big rip. Anybody want to guesstimate or have an idea about what the big rip is? And these are actually scientifically doctoral type people with great research and algorithms and great thought. This is actually a serious theory put out there. The big rip is the idea that it's going to keep expanding and what's eventually going to happen is that galaxies will be ripped apart, planets will be ripped apart, and even atoms will be ripped apart. Okay, the big rip. And so everything just kind of breaks because it just rips apart. All right, there's also, when, it, when I was in middle school, I think it was, is when I heard this, there's the idea of the big burn, and that's for this planet, that the sun is expanding, and it would expand eventually, that it would absorb the earth, and we would just burn up in the sun. Anybody else ever hear of that in middle school? Okay. Yeah, it's just going to burn it up. There's another big burn that's been popular for about 20, 25 years because before this, there was actually a big freeze. But anyways, the bit, what's the, the big burn for the planet now? Because of why? Cows and cars. <laughs> I think because cows and cars are polluting the atmosphere and it's just going to get hotter and hotter and hotter and there'll be famine and drought and death and desolation and humanity will become extinct and the life on the planet will become extinct and that's, you know, and I labeled it the Big Burn, the Big Burn 1, the Big Burn 2. That's me labeling that. There's nobody serious out there who's labeled it that that I know of. Anyways, of course... We don't take any of these serious. All, all these are based on the beginning assumption that there was a Big Bang, that the universe has a naturalistic explanation for being here. God does not exist, every single one of them. And so... Looking at it from that perspective, you understand it matters what you believe. Do you believe there's a God? Do you not believe there's a God? Do you believe the universe was created? Or do you think it's just a random happenstance accident? Because depending on which view you take, it will affect how you view the future and what's going to happen to the universe. And in the the humanist secular standpoint, every single one of those, what's at the end of it? What's that? Extinction, death, obliteration, oblivion, nothing. Very dark. But the Bible explanation of it gives us hope, gives us confidence. There's a lot of anxiety involved with these ideas of the universe. It's just kind of going, and people get anxious about that, and people get anxious about climate change, and 
They get worried about everything. And what are we doing? And what are we going to do about it? And it's needless anxiety and worry. Because the Bible would teach us and does teach us that God has power and God has control. And so everything is okay. And we'll dig into some more of that in just a little bit. But there are also some religious people, and when I say religious people who believe in God, who believe in Jesus Christ, that have other eschatologies for the end of the universe than what's presented in the Bible. And we'll talk about what's in the Bible in a minute. But does anybody know the really predominant one in our culture among people in denominations, community churches, what they see at the end. It's a funny word that we use. What's that? It's a part of it. What's that bigger theory? Yeah, premillennialism, right? They believe in premillennialism which is essentially, you know, there's these signs that the Bible talks about of the end times, and we're watching out for those, and ooh, we see them everywhere because there's bad stuff going on in the world, which there's always been bad stuff going on in the world. But they say there's going to be this rapture where the, you know, people who are right with God are just going to disappear one day, and nobody will understand or know why. And then there will be this tribulation, these seven years of tribulations generally within their explanations There's going to be the Armageddon, the Battle of Armageddon at the end of that. Then Christ is going to establish a reign on earth for a thousand years. And at the end of that thousand years, there's going to be the judgment and we'll enter into eternity. So that's their eschatology. Another eschatology out there is the 70 AD doctrine that's believed by brethren. And it is just as convoluted as premillennialism. It's really hard if you've ever studied it. One day, maybe Lord willing, we'll study it. I don't think we've studied it other than briefly mentioning it, but it is absolutely absurd in how any brethren could believe it is beyond me. But here it is in a nutshell. 70 AD was the end. It was the second coming of Christ, the resurrection, destruction of Hades, Judgment took place in 70 AD. The earth will never be annihilated, and now is heaven on earth. Brethren, believe that. And they believe you're an ignorant rube if you can't see it. Because they have special knowledge. Trust me, it's the most arrogant thing I've ever seen. Go ahead. Uh, You just, they don't explain that. I, I think their idea is you're just in heaven, spiritual versus heaven, earth, but it's kind of convoluted. Yeah, Philip. Majorly so. And you got a problem with the Lord's Supper, right? We proclaim his death till he comes, but they still partake of it, which, why? But anyways, well, Lord willing, maybe one day dig into that. So let's jump into the Bible. Let's first of all go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and let's just step through what the Bible says is going to happen at the end. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 3. Who will read that for us? Go ahead, Zach. Okay, so first point of the end, what's it going to be like? It's going to be a surprise, right? A shock. Well, I I believe what the illustration is, is she knows it's coming. It's going to come, but she doesn't know exactly when. 
and you know it might hit at four in the afternoon or two in the morning or she and we know the judgment's coming we just don't know when Right, right, exactly. We, we should be very aware and prepared for that. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 to tie in some statements made by the Lord on this. In Matthew 24, verses 36 to 44, and notice what he says about the end. Uh, who will get that? Go ahead, Carter. Okay, so there at the end, he brings in the idea of the thief in the night again, but overall, he's talking about the same concept. You're just not going to know when that happens. So what part of premillennialism does that contradict? Does that dispel? Right, right. And that that thing about two men in verse 40, one in the field, the other take, the other left, two women at the mill, one grinding, the other left. So wh what that's pointing to is what we'll read about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that there are going to be some that are caught up with the Lord, and that means there's some that's not. It's not talking about the rapture, it's just talking about there's this separation in the end. Mike, did you have something? Right, right, exactly. And like he said, every generation has had this. The uh, Jehovah's Witness, Seventh-day Adventist movements were born out of failed prophecies in the 1840s and where people went and sold all they had. They went and they dressed in white robes and went out in, into the fields because they, they believed there was a specific day the Lord was going to return. And it's uh, referred to as a great disappointment because a lot of people became skeptics after that because they bought into uh, William Miller's ideas and it, it caused them to not believe in the Lord. This idea that they could see signs and they didn't, it didn't come about. So yeah, this dispels the ideas of that there's any signs. There's not going to be any signs. It's just, it's going to happen. All right. So first Thessalonians chapter four, then first Thessalonians chapter four. So it's going to happen suddenly it will be something that men are going to experience being caught off guard, not realizing it's going to happen then when it does happen. So 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18. Who's got that for us? Ron.
lest we sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we also God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Okay, so what are some of the things he says will occur when the Lord returns? Say that again. Okay, the Lord will descend from heaven. What's that telling us there? Anything? It says we're going to see him. He'll descend, we're, we're going to see him return. Just like in Acts chapter 1, when the disciples were standing there and they saw the Lord ascend up in a cloud and disappear, remember the angels told them, why he's standing up, he's going to return as you saw him go. So it's going to be a visible return when he comes back. Um, the premillennial theory says the rapture, it's an invisible return, where the Bible never speaks of anything like that. What else is going to happen? Okay, what, what two things does it liken it to? Okay, there's going to be this shout, this cry out, the like an archangel crying to the world and the blast of the trumpet. So it's going to be visual, it's going to be audible, it's going to be overwhelming. Nobody's going to miss it. Everyone's going to see it and hear it at the same time. Anything else it says is going to happen? Ron. Right. Right. It doesn't say anything about him coming on earth, remaining on earth, you know, this glorious reign of paradise on earth. Although it does say that we'll be caught up in the clouds with him. Exactly. We're going up to him. And John is brought to the very fact that there will be people on this earth because John is called the man who talked about the seasons. <laughs> there are also angels in heaven. Exactly. Cows. cows. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. So there, there's not going to be the big freeze, the big burn, the big rip, the big crunch. It's because life is going to be going on. Right. Right, exactly right. And one of the things he says there in verse 14, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Well, the, the rapture 
is the opposite. People leaving instead of people returning. But the way to understand this is, the idea is there are those, as we talked about before, we talked about it last week, the souls of the righteous are in Hades, in paradise, in the bosom of Abraham, and that's what he's talking about bringing back. They, they have to be brought back out of that realm in order to be resurrected, and that's why later he says, you know, the dead in Christ will rise first, because he's brought them back, they rise, and then those who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the air to meet the Lord, to be with the Lord forever. So, yeah, all those things are going to be taking place when the Lord comes back. Any other thoughts on that? Let's go to John chapter 5. And we touched on this last week, and so we'll just briefly hit it here. But John 5, verses 28 and 29. John 5, 28 and 29. Who will read that for us? Charles? Okay, so what's going to happen there? Resurrection? Everybody, all who are in the graves? Anything else? Why are they going to come out of the graves? Okay. Yeah, hear his voice, right? So what does that correspond to over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? What's that? The noise, the shout, right? It's going to be this shout that comes forward and... You see here his voice is going to call out to bring people out of their graves, just like he stood before Lazarus' grave, said, Lazarus, come forth. Instead of calling one individual, he's calling all individuals out of the grave. So there's going to be this great resurrection. Of course, 1 Corinthians 15, again, we touched on this last week. What does it say is going to happen at the resurrection? Like what's actually going to unfold? No, the resurrection will be judged after we're resurrected, but the actual resurrection itself. Right, here he says called out of the graves, and people have a hard time wrapping their mind around that. What do you mean called out of the graves? Because... You know, there's been people buried in the ground for thousands of years, and they've returned to the dust. Literally, it's just their body is dust. And there's other things that have happened with people, as we talked about last time. You know, there are people eaten by animals or they're burned up in fire. You know, the people in Hiroshima, they just vaporized some of those people. So, yes, exactly right. So there's going to be this great change that occurs from the corruptible body, the corruptible elements that made up the body or make up the body if you're alive, those things into that which is incorruptible, that which will last through eternity. Whatever body that is, that's, that's what's going to take place. So he's calling us out of the grave, so it's going to be this great change for both the living and the dead. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. And so that's going to take place. He comes back, audible, visible, calls people out of the graves. There we are, all of humanity, everyone who has ever lived, ever existed, right there before him on the day of judgment. Let's go to Revelation 20. 
Revelation 20 as we're turning over there. Any thoughts before we get there? Revelation 20, let's read verses 7 through 10. Remember, book of Revelation, really talking about the cause of Christ. Is it going to survive the persecution of Rome between the Roman government, the pagan religion, the iniquities of the world? Is it, is it going to be able to survive all of that? And the resounding answer is yes. And at the end of the book, it gives us that fast-forward look into the future at the very end. Here, here's what's going to happen at the end of all things. So Revelation 20, let's read verses 7 through 10. Who will get that, Elijah? Okay, so this lake of fire and brimstone, what is that? It's hell. So the beast, the false prophet, have been tossed in there, and he says here at the end, the devil's going to be tossed in there as well. He's, he's utterly and completely defeated in the end. If we go over to 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, let's read here verses 10 through 13, 10 through 13, please. Who will get that? Micah? All right, so what is this explaining in a different way compared to where we began in Psalm 102 and what the Hebrew writer talks about? What's going to happen? Exactly. Exactly. It's going to be completely consumed. In fact, what does it say is going to happen? It's it's gonna they're gonna two two things in particular he talks about. Verse twelve. Okay. If something is dissolved what happens in this in this sense of the word? Not diluted, which is different than dissolved. What's that? Well, it talks about the elements being melted in a fervent heat. It's trying to give us in language that we understand of these things going in, uh, becoming nothing. They're going to be gone. It, it won't exist anymore. Whatever form, whatever shape that would take, how, however that may be, is they're just they're going to go. So the. Exactly, exactly right. So you, you think about this. You know, the 
Genesis chapter 1 talks about in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Earth was out without form, darkness on the face of the earth, and so on and so forth. And there, we, we've got the universe, we've got the sun, the moon, the stars, but then we have, they exist within the universe. Something I think maybe we don't understand is before that point, there was no universe. There was nothing. Right? Any, because the, the universe, the expanse, that area between the planets and stars and galaxies, it wasn't there. He brought all of these things into existence, including what we call outer space. He brought it into existence in 2 Peter chapter 3, as well as Hebrews 1 and Psalm 1 and 2. They're all saying, that's going away. And there's going to be this new heavens and new earth, and that's mentioned over in the book of Revelation as well. And all that, all that simply is referring to is there's going to be a new realm of existence, not this one, a different one, where we will be with the Lord forever. We're going to be in heaven with him forever around the throne of God, as Revelation explains in vivid detail. So it's all going to go away, and nothing will be here. It won't go to a singular point and then expand back out. It's not like it's going to rip atoms apart and there's half atoms floating around all over the place. It's just, whoosh, it's not there. And that's hard for us to wrap our minds around. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around nothing and then something and God bringing all these things into existence. How could that be? Well, it's, it's all going to go away. Well, how could that be? Well, it's miraculous. It's beyond our ability to understand. All right, so all that's going to take place. The devil's cast into the lake of fire. All these things coming to an end. And then, of course, ultimately what's going to happen with all of us. All of us? Anybody want to expound on Paul's statement that all of us? Okay. Yes. So the judgment, think of it this way, because some people say, well, don't we know where we're going when we die? Well, yes. You die, you're going to be in paradise, you're going to be in torments, and you're going to know whether you're going to end up in heaven or hell, but the judgment is this great and final separation where we receive that new body and enter into that eternal dwelling place. Hades is just temporary. There's no body there. It's your soul that's there. In this new existence, we'll have a body, and we will where we're going is going to be forever. So there's this final separation. And it's very interesting to me, you know, uh, by the way, Matthew 25 talks about the parable of the ten virgins. It talks about the parable of the talents of money. And it talks about the, the sheep and the goats being separated. And I believe that's what Zach had referenced to, this great separation of all men standing before God. But one of the things you note in all of this is everyone's going to, who's going to heaven is going to enter heaven at the same time. Sometimes people think that like Moses and Elijah are in heaven. They're not. They're not on earth, but they're not in heaven. One of the things Jesus talks about, and I forget the reference right offhand, no man has seen God at any time. Well, that includes Moses and Elijah. They haven't seen him. They're, they're awaiting that eternal reward, even though in Enoch, right?
Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. 2 Corinthians 5. Well, let's read verses 9 through 11. Let's, let's grab that whole piece there. As he's talking about the same things about this great judgment that takes place. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11. Who will get that for us? Ron? done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad, knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord to persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. Okay, so we want to be pleasing to him because we're going to go before the judgment seat of Christ and be judged on what we've done in our life that will have a continuing effect, as Mike was talking about. So we have to be mindful what we're doing right now is not just impacting our life, the life of the people around us. It's going to impact the next generation, the next generation, the next generation. That's part of what the Old Testament especially emphasizes, you know, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the third and fourth generation. It's, you know, there's it goes beyond us, and we, we need to really think about how we conduct ourselves, because it is going to have that kind of impact, and we'll stand before God and give an, a, give an account for how we have lived our lives, whether righteous or unrighteous, whether good or evil. And so we need to turn away from sin and do what's right, as Micah read a while ago, Second Peter chapter 3, you know, what manner of conduct should we have now? It needs to be righteous conduct, godly conduct. Because it's coming to an end. This world, the universe, our lives will eventually come to an end. And of course, what are what does the New Testament teach in particular that we are going to receive when we go to heaven? There's something it talks about. Crown of life. Sometimes it refers to it as crown of righteousness. We're going to receive a crown, right? Here's a reward. Here's an acknowledgement. You are a child of the king, if you will. You're a prince. You're a princess. I, I don't know. Maybe that's not the appropriate way to put it, but we receive this crown, this reward acknowledging we are righteous and we're blessed to be in the heaven. So, all right. Thank you all very much. Lord willing, we'll start first and second Thessalonians next week with an introductory lesson.